years of special effects experience. Freedom! Joining them, Red Imahara. You <laughs> suck. Tori Bellici. Put your back into it. And Carrie Barton. High explosives and electricity. Woo! They don't just tell the bits. They put them to the test. sermon series for prime time. As you can see, the first video, or the first TV show today is Mythbusters. This has been one of my favorite TV shows for a long time. It's educational, it's fun, and they always blow stuff up. <laughs> Unfortunately, today I won't be blowing anything up. But it always kind of reminded me of um, Bill Nye the Science Guy for grown-ups. It was a fun way to learn. And sometimes I think the best way to learn is to have some of these common ideas disproved and then replaced with what is the truth. And so that's what we're doing today. We have two myths that I want to bust today about Christianity. And the first is that Jesus was just a good man or a good prophet. And the second is that we have to be perfect in order to come to Jesus. So let's start with the first one. Jesus was just a good prophet. We know this is wrong because all the Gospels say that Jesus was the Son of God. Matthew 16, verses 13 through 16, is <coughs> Peter's confession. It says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, or Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, Son of the living God. Simon realized, Simon Peter, realized that Jesus was the Son of God. He knew at that moment, he wasn't just a prophet, he wasn't just a man. He was the full Son of God. Matthew 1.23 Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Mary and Joseph, upon the birth of Jesus, knew right away that he was the Son of God. They knew that their son was more than just an ordinary baby. <coughs> they knew he was deity. He was God. He was special. And then others, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the very beginning of Mark. Mark is often considered the root gospel because it is the one that Matthew and Luke draw off of. The very first verse in Mark says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He gets that out right away. He wants you to know exactly what you are reading. You are reading the story of the Son of God. Jesus was not just a prophet. <coughs> he was not just a man. Even the demons knew that he was Son of God. Matthew 8, 28 through 29. And when he came to the other side, to the country of Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met with him. Coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass. And behold, they cried out, What have you done with us, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? They recognized that he was more than just a man, more than just a prophet. They feared him. They recognized he was the Son of God. We know that these Gospels can be trusted. Matthew himself was an eyewitness to most of these events. Matthew was one of the twelve apostles. And so his book, even though he draws a lot of it off of Mark, he has a lot of detail that wasn't in Mark because he saw it personally. Mark was a companion of Peter. Peter, obviously being one of the twelve disciples and probably the most prominent one. After Jesus' death, Peter traveled around and was preaching Jesus' life story. And so Mark's book 
is basically just a transcription of Peter's sermons. We attribute it to Mark all the time, but sometimes I wonder if it should be called Peter. We also know the Gospels can be trusted because something so so momentous as a new religion being started has been recorded in history. The Romans kept track of things like this. They obviously knew when what they considered a cult was being started. They feared it. They tried to push it down. They also kept track of who was being crucified. And so Jesus' crucifixion would have gone into history books. It would have been kept as a record, Jesus of Nazareth crucified. I don't know what they would have said. (laughs) That's the other point, is that Jesus really did die and really was raised from the dead. We know this because Paul just flat out says it. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 6, Jesus appears to people after his death. He appears alive. (coughs) He says, For I delivered to you, as of the first importance, what I also received. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, (coughs) then to the twelve, and then he appeared appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. So it wasn't just that the 12 apostles decided, hey, let's pretend that Jesus lived and make everyone believe it. It was 500 people scattered throughout the nation of Israel, probably some in Rome, probably some in other countries. 500 different people saw Jesus alive. So it wasn't that Christianity started as this this little tiny movement in the center of Jerusalem. It was, it started out everywhere. How can that have been faked? How could that have been a bunch of people just pulling a prank? How could they have communicated something like that across the entire nation of Israel? So that everyone at the same time starts believing the same thing. Some still claim that it's falsified. That they they stole the body from the cross, or stole the body from the tomb, and then claimed he was resurrected. The thing with that is, the Roman guards were very good at what they did. When they crucified someone, they made sure they were dead. They went through and broke the kneecaps, Jesus' case, he was already dead, so they stabbed him with a spear to make sure he was dead. After he was crucified, he was taken laying in a tomb and then had guards posted around his tomb for that very reason. People feared that someone would come steal the body and claim he was resurrected. And so the guards were there, and how willing would the guards be to help these new Christians? Not very likely. They probably feared what would happen if exactly what did happen, (coughs) a new religion started. (coughs) They probably wanted to make sure that Jesus really was dead. I've even heard some people claim that Jesus hypnotized everyone. When I actually heard this, I was kind of shocked. Who thinks of that? The only problem with that is I have not seen any hypnotist that can hypnotize an entire nation. I have not even seen any hypnotist that can hypnotize a single room of people. There is a reason when they're on stage, they only bring up a handful of people (coughs) because they can only hypnotize a certain amount of people. They can't have that much influence over a large amount of people. And even then, it also depends on if the person is willing to be hypnotized. 
when you go watch a hypnotist at the fair or whatever, the people they pick are the ones that are raising their hands, cheering, standing up, wanting to be brought onto stage. You never see them pick the 200-something pound guy who's sitting there with his arms crossed glaring at them. Because I don't want to be hypnotized. And I very highly doubt they could hypnotize me. <coughs> I've actually wanted to sometimes go up there and just like completely resist whatever they're doing and just stand there blank. Ignore whatever they're trying to do. But then again, they just tell me to go sit down and draw someone else up. And so, hypnotizing the unwilling, there were plenty around that would not be willing to be hypnotized. The Pharisees, they're the ones that wanted Jesus killed. Why would they be willing to be hypnotized and then believe that he was alive? The Romans, they're the ones that actually did kill Jesus. Once again, why would they be willing to? And Romans, I'm pretty sure, were big, tough, mean guys. They were probably not very open to certain things like hypnotism. <coughs> I kind of picture some of the Roman guards, like the, the London guards, who just stand there. No matter what you do, they completely ignore you. And so I wonder, how could you hypnotize someone who's ignoring you? And then the last point. I feel like this has kind of been overused sometimes, but it's probably the most true. Is all the martyrs who were willing to die for the cause. All the apostles, except one, were martyred. Judas killed himself, and I think it was John died of natural causes. The ten others were all martyred. They died because they were preaching something that no one else really agreed with. Why would they be willing to die for a cause that was fake? <coughs> and so, going back to the idea, Jesus was just a good man or a good prophet. I don't see how people can believe that. There were too many things in his life. He performed many miracles. He died and then was raised from the dead, and he had people willing to follow him unto death. How many people do you know of that have followers like that? Our next one, our next myth, is that we must be perfect before we can come to Jesus. Many, many people believe this. I've believed it on my own. That we have to fix ourselves up before we can become Christian. Or before we're worthy to do whatever he wants us to do. <coughs> before we're, we can be called. The Pharisees obeyed the laws and traditions. They were, they held the law to the letter. They were probably considered at that time the most righteous people in the land. But yet Jesus did not like them. He loved them. He loved everyone. He had so many conflicts with the Pharisees, though. They were the ones that were constantly trying to disprove him. Just because they were appearing to everyone to be good and righteous doesn't mean that they were necessarily worthy to come into a relationship with Jesus. And I think sometimes we think of ourselves like this. We try and fix ourselves. We try to behave on our own. We try to do all these things, but we don't necessarily realize that just because we behave and we act good and we're not breaking the law doesn't mean that we're going to get into heaven. We have this idea that we have to be perfect. We should strive for perfection, yes, but <coughs> perfection isn't necessarily possible. Paul states in Philippians 3, 12 through 14, Not that I have attained this already, 
or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Paul right there states that, no, he's not perfect. Paul was probably the furthest from being perfect. He was the one that was hunting down Christians, preaching against them. He was the one that held the coast while Stephen was being martyred. And yet, God still used him. God still called him. And Paul became one of the greatest missionaries we know. We also look at the fact that Jesus hung out with the tax collectors and pros prostitutes. Probably what was considered the lowest class in the Israelite society. Matthew himself, the apostle Matthew, one of Christ's main followers, was a tax collector. He was one that was probably hated by everyone. He took money from the Israelites and gave it to the Romans. They considered him a traitor because what he was doing supported those who were oppressing him, them. The other apostles were fishermen. Now when I think of fishermen, I don't think of people who are happy-go-lucky, view everything as perfect and optimistic. I think of these gruff guys who, when they stub their toe, they swear. If they don't make a very good catch, they go and drink and get upset about it. It's just the kind of lifestyle. They're, they're abrupt. They're, <coughs> they're not very refined. And so, obviously, they're not perfect. And even Mary Magdalene herself was a prostitute. Jesus... One of the only female followers that we hear of was Mary Magdalene. And we consider that she was a prostitute, and according to Luke, she was even demon-possessed. <coughs> Luke chapter 8, 1 through 3. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom the seven demons had come out, and many others. Jesus took the time to not necessarily wait for Mary Magdalene to cast out her own demons <coughs> and come to him. It's not like we can do that either. We can't cast out our own demons. Jesus cast out those demons, and then he called her. So to end this, I think about the fact that God gives us strength to do all things. There are many things we struggle with that we just can't put aside like that. Some of us have addictions, bad habits. Some of us have something in our past that's bugging us. <laughs> Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things in Christ who strengthens me. It doesn't matter what we're addicted to. It doesn't matter what habits we've gotten into doesn't matter what we're doing. If we believe and trust in Christ, He will save us. I'm sure this will be covered more by Hendry in The Extreme Makeover. But let's look at what has been said, or what the two myths. Jesus was a good man and a prophet. That has been busted. He was the Son of God and really was raised from the dead. Next, we have to be perfect before we can come to Jesus. Also busted. He hung out with the people who were considered the least perfect. And so, if you believe both these things to be true, I ask that you pray this prayer with me. Father, I thank you that you have loved us, Lord. I thank you that your Son really was the Son of God, and that he came to die for us. And I thank you that we don't have to be perfect before we can accept him. <coughs> I ask that you would enter our lives and that you would
continue to grow with us, Lord. That you'd help us to become more like you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good job.